So the, the second speaker in, in this morning's session uh, is uh, Nader Ngeta. He's professor of electrical engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Ngeta received his bachelor's degree at the University of Tehran yeah. in Iran. He received his master's degree and PhD degree from Caltech. He has a very wide range of interests. Uh, makes it hard to pigeonhole him, but let's say he's interested, he's made significant contributions to the fields of metamaterials, transformation optics, nanophotonics, and related disciplines. Uh, perhaps he is best known for his invention of the field of, opti uh, of optical metatronics. And the idea of this, I hope he will explain it to us, I will do a poor job, I, I fear, uh, is to develop nanostructures which act as lumped elements but for an optical circuit. And by putting these components together, for example, on an optical chip, you can synthesize complex optical circuits. So please uh, help me in uh, welcoming Professor Ngeta to our symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bob. It's, it's a pleasure and honor for me to be here. I'd like to thank you know, the organizer, Professor Bob Boyd, Professor Paul Kirkham, and Dr. Ben Sussman, and all the members of the organizing committee for, uh, for bringing all of us here in this wonderful event. And uh, it's really, truly a pleasure and honor for me to be part of this event. Uh, now, it was mentioned by Professor Haroche that the, this year is a special year for all of us in the field of optics and photonics for a variety of this historical anniversaries uh, that's happening uh, going back to the 1,000 years ago and to 150 years of Maxwell uh, equations. A few months ago, in month of July, I was asked by IEEE to give a talk in the occasion of the 150th anniversary of Maxwell's equations, the equations that we love and we use you know, every day in our work. So uh, in, in preparing my talk for that historical, I mean, perspective of Maxwell's, uh, I said to myself, of course, Maxwell's equations, we use them all the time and wonderful, but just out of curiosity, what are the other equations that you know, have uh, changed significantly the development of science and technology in human history? So uh, the first thing we did, just Google it uh, to see what we get. And when I Googled that, uh, I came across this book uh, by Professor Yuan Stewart, who's a mathematician and science writer in England. Uh, the title of his book is uh, In Pursuit of the Unknown, 17 Equations That Changed the World. So just for fun, let's go over the 17 equations in chronological order. Maxwell's equation would be number 11. It's just a chronological order. So which equation do you think is the earliest one that, according to Professor Stewart, really changed uh, the human history? Goes back to Pythagoras' theorem. A squared plus B squared equal to C squared. Of course, we take it for granted, but indeed, it's good. Very important, 530 BC. Next one, John Nepper, 16 term logarithm. And of course, Isaac Newton, the definition of the derivative. By the way, Newton has two of them of this 17, and there's another scientist has two of them. We'll get to that. And uh, Newton, of course, uh, for uh, gravitational law of gravity. D'Alembert, 1746, wave equations. Uh, moving along, Euler. Now this one, by the way, was very interesting to me. I squared equal to minus one. And of course, we do that all the time, but it's one of the 17 equation, according to Stuart. Uh, important, by the way, Euler has two of them. He's another scientist that has two of them in the Euler formula for polyhedra, which was basically the foundation of the field of topology. And the Gauss for normal distributions, the Fourier, of course, you know, use them every day. And Navier-Stokes equation actually predates Maxwell's equation. Uh, and, of course, our beloved Maxwell's equations that we have in uh, 1865, Boltzmann's second law of thermodynamics, Einstein, the relativity, Schrodinger equation, 1927, uh, Claude Shannon, information theory, of course. Uh, now, Robert May, 1975, in chaos theory, is coming to the, to the years that some of us have been born, so it's coming more close. And, uh, Black and Scholl equation, 1990s for financial market and the derivative. By the way, this was the only one I didn't know anything about. So I checked, as asked my daughter, who is in the area of finance, she said, yes, actually, this is an important equation. <laughs> so I trust her judgment. 
And uh, so uh, also I'd like to share with you some, uh, I mean, personal observation of this special year of 150th anniversary of Maxwell's equations. Uh, a few months ago in February of this year, I had the privilege to be in a conference in the Royal Society in London uh, called the Faraday Discussions. It's a very interesting conference, by the way. I can tell you offline, you know, interesting format it has. And after the banquet in the Royal Society, we were walking around and, and there was these windows around the hall that they have, you know, historical items, you know, in these windows. And one of the students came to me and says, come here, come here. It's a very interesting item I would like you to see in this window. And uh, when I went there, he showed me the original manuscript by Maxwell, the way he had handwritten it. So I took my iPhone and took a picture. This is it. This is the original paper by Maxwell. And you notice the speed of light, you know, showing up right over here. And uh, right next to it, there was an interesting historical description of this manuscript that he had submitted that. And guess who was the editor of the philosophical transaction of the Royal Society who received this manuscript? George Stokes, you know, Stokes parameter. He was the secretary of the, of the transaction. Maxwell uh, submitted it in October 27, 1864. It was read in December 8, 1864. And it went to the printer June 16, 1865. And particularly, I love this sentence that they highlighted over here. It says, the agreement of the results seems to show that light and magnetism are affections of the same substance and that light is an electromagnetic disturbance propagated through the field according to electromagnetic laws. And arguably with that sentence, he changed the world. And that's why we are here after 150 years of a lot of development that originated from Maxwell and we get over here. But just before I leave it, one other piece of interesting history. Right next to it, it shows actually who reviewed this paper, by the way. It's interesting. Actually, Stokes reviewed it, but he sent it also to Lord Kelvin. And this is the note that Lord Kelvin has written on March 15, 1865. My dear Stokes, I'm sorry to have kept Maxwell's paper so long. I read it nearly through with great interest almost immediately after it came to me. And I think it most decidedly suitable for publication in the transactions. If you can allow me to keep it a few days longer, I would be glad to have it till Monday. And unless I hear from you, I shall pass it on on Monday. I guess something never changed. Reviewers are always late. <laughs> they need more time. Uh, so anyway, there is this past 150 years, uh, you heard from beautiful talk by Professor Haroche that there's a lot of scientific and technological development has happened. And in fact, you can view that as uh, coming from the two processes. One is how we can actually control the path of charge carriers. And that would be for fermions. And another one is how to manipulate and tailor electromagnetic waves, how to manipulate photons. And indeed, if you look at all the technological development, you can distribute it into these two categories. In fact, if you look at this you know, uh, night nightmare circuit diagram that the people in electrical engineering like to forget, essentially what we have over here is manipulating where the charges go. And that's what it leads to interesting you know, functionality. Now, in the case of photons, we need to have materials in order to interact and to manipulate Photons. And in the past uh, several years, the field of uh, metamaterial or the artificially engineering material such that it will have the parameters you like to have, not what nature has given us, have evolved quite significantly because of the process of nanoscience and nanofabrication. And indeed, you know, in the concept of metamaterial is that you try to embed a material with other type of inclusions in order to have a bulk property to have different collective effect rather than the local individual effect. And this will show up, of course, in parametrization of the material, namely the parameters we love to use, you know, in interaction of light with the macroscopic structures like permittivity, permeability, nonlinear susceptibility, and so on and so forth. In my group, we are interested to look at some of the extreme scenarios of this ability to control light-matter interaction and one of the extreme platform that we are studying is, of course, combining the concept of metamaterial light matter interaction with the one atom thick structures, and that's, of course, graphene. And that, indeed, will give us the possibility of having optical devices that would be one atom thick. So that would be extreme in dimensionality. And one of the things we are working on right now is how to actually have a hybrid system of these one atom thick structures with the dielectric structure in order to have man-made type of like carbon nanotube 
but not what nature has given us. Carbon nanotube that you would like to have with the dimensionality you like to have. Another uh, extreme scenario we're considering is time reversal symmetry breaking in the extreme near field of some of these, you know, structure like plasmonic structures. And what you see over here is a very interesting optical vortex result of our simulation that will show that in the very extreme near field, very, very small compared to the wavelength, you can have actually very interesting optical vortices. And that allowed us to actually uh, suggest a very interesting device that would be a optical circulator, but at the nanoscale. Circulator that when the photons come over here will go in this direction, but when the photon coming back reflected, it doesn't go there, it will go over here. So the time reversal symmetry is broken, but it's broken in the nanoscale. Another extreme scenario we are, we are studying right now is what the, uh, my good friend Bob referred to, and that is the area of optical metatronics that we introduced in my uh, group. And what it is, is to actually get inspiration from electronics, that we have lumped circuit element in electronics, like resistor, capacitor, inductor, and how to have those lumped circuitry in the photonics, to have nanoparticles that behave as lumped circuit element. And that will give you an interesting toolbox to actually look at the design from electronics, nanoelectronics, and bring it directly one-to-one -one correspondence into photonics. And one of the things we are working on these aspects right now is to actually look at the possibility of putting this nanostructure next to each other in order to allow the light to do mathematical operations. In other words, let the wave do the math, as I, I like to call it, or to call it photonic calculus. So this is what I call it the informatic uh, metastructures, that by having a layered structure, or it could be nanoparticles, you actually design a system that as the light goes through this, the output becomes the result of a mathematical operation of your choice on the arbitrary input. So essentially, you have kind of like an analog computer, but in the nanoscale and using light. And another extreme scenario we are studying is how to actually design structure that would have light parameters would be near zero, like permittivity being near zero, permeability being near zero, index of refraction being near zero, and what other implication, both from wave physics and from quantum optics, we can actually get out of this. For example, one of the uh, aspects of this uh, structure is that you can have a very strange, I call it strange or extreme cavities, that would actually deal with light and wave propagation in a very unusual way. So in my talk today, I'm gonna concentrate on this last part to see how the extreme scenario in the material parameters can actually help us to look at some of the unusual light matter interaction. So let's go towards that direction. So let's start again from our uh, um, Maxwell's equation that we love very much. So if you look at the uh, source-free, time harmonic, macroscopic Maxwell's equation in the classical electrodynamics, obviously we're all familiar with that and we love to use them. Now we all know, by the way, if the frequency of operation is zero, in other words, if you have a DC signal, electricity and magnetism would be decoupled. In fact, that's how Maxwell and Faraday in the 19th century tried to show that if you have a dynamic field, then electricity and magnetism would be coupled. And that's what we have, Maxwell's equation. So we ask ourselves this, uh, this strange question. Is it possible to design structures such that at the free, given frequency of interest, the effective permittivity and effective permeability will be zero? And if such a structure is possible, then Maxwell's equation will be decoupled. But this is not a regular decoupling that we see in the DC scenario, because we have the field that's actually oscillating with the frequency omega that you like to have. But if you design the material that at the frequency of operation, you have effective permittivity and permeability near zero, then macroscopically, and I emphasize macroscopically and effectively, electricity and magnetism will be decoupled. Now, what's the implication of that? Well, one thing is that from the distribution point of view, it's actually quite oxymoron stru structure. In other words, from temporal point of view, they're dynamics, because they're varying with time. But from spatial distribution point of view, would be just like a static distribution. Now, why is that? Because the index of refraction is near zero. It means at the frequency of operation, your effective wavelength is very long. So every structure looks small. Now, one thing I'd like to say right from the start, sometime when I give a talk, people ask me this question, wait a second, if your n is equal to zero, 
your phase velocity would be greater than velocity of light. Are you violating causality? No. The system is a dispersive system. Group velocity and energy velocity is less than velocity of light. We are all OK. These are all causal. But the phase velocity in the CW system is actually 0, and that's perfectly fine. So that's what I call it. Colloquially, I call it static optics. Although I realize that this is an oxymoron terminology, because how come optics can be static, and how come static can be optics? But you're going to see in the result I showed that, indeed, this could be an interesting terminology for that. So in order to get into this, let's, let me take you back in the history about 10 years ago. 10 years ago in my group, we introduced the concept of epsilon near zero structure. So only one of them equal to zero first. So back in 2005, uh, we introduced this concept of epsilon near zero structure, and we discovered an interesting phenomena that will come from this structure. So let me take you back 10 years ago, and I tell you how actually we came up with this question. We started with a very simple question. Imagine that you have a parallel plate waveguides with a metallic wall, impenetrable wall, simplest possible waveguide you consider, and you have a TEM mode, which is the simplest possible mode coming down this waveguide. Okay? And imagine you have another waveguide very similar to that, not necessarily coplanar. It could be any angle you want over there. And the question we pose is, what would happen if I connect these two waveguides in a very arbitrary way, completely arbitrary? Now, what would you expect that the mode to see this structure? When the mode comes over here, you see this transition, which is quite arbitrary. Most of it reflects back. That's what you expect. So then I ask this question, what would happen if we fill this region with a material with permittivity near zero. Now, why we were thinking that this might actually give us some interesting solution before even we solve the problem? Because of the intuition we had in the following. If the epsilon is near zero, index is near zero. If index is near zero, the wavelength would be very long. If the wavelength would be very long, then the phase of the wave along this structure would be uniform. And if the phase is uniform, whatever phase I have over here is the same phase I have over there. So in that case, this should radiate. And by conservation of energy, we should have a very little reflection. This was one intuition. But there was another intuition that was just the opposite of that. And that is, if we are inside the material and epsilon is 0, the wave impedance of the material is very high, square root of mu over epsilon. So then, in that case, we would have a huge impedance mismatch over here. So maybe everything would reflect back. Even though I have a zero phase, but if the magnitude is zero, it's not good for me. So we decided to solve this problem to find out which one of these intuition it is true. So we got to work on this problem, and we got lucky. We got lucky because we were able to solve this problem analytically exactly. And the result is this, this simple formula. Very simple formula representing the reflection coefficient of this mode that's coming over here. And if I'd like this reflection coefficient to be 0, I have to make sure the numerator is 0. So let's walk over this to see under what condition this numerator would be 0. This numerator has this real part and imaginary part. Real part to be 0, which means this A1 should be equal to A2. OK, that's fine. The two waveguides should be similar. But remember, there is no mention of the angle of this. So even it could be 180 degrees bent over here. But in order to make this thing 0, I have to make one of these three parameters 0. OK, so what are these parameters? One is k0, which is omega over c, which means frequency 0. But that's not interesting, because frequency 0 is the dc. It means if I put a battery over here, I get the same voltage over here. OK, so what? That's not good. Another possibility is to make mu sub r equal to 0. But this mu is the permeability of this region. Epsilon is already 0. If I make mu equal to 0, then I have impedance match. OK, that would be a possibility. In, that, in those days, we didn't want to touch the mu. Right now, we are working on the mu equal to 0, too. But in those days, we said, just stick with the epsilon. I don't want to change the mu. And the third possibility to make a sub d equal to 0. But I haven't told you what a sub d is yet. a sub d is this cross-sectional area that you see over here. In other words, if I make that cross-sectional area smaller and smaller, the wave actually tunnels through this better and better. Very counterintuitive. At first, we didn't believe that. We double check, triple check all of this, and exactly satisfying Maxwell's equation. So first, we decided to actually look at the simulation before we do experiment. Now, this is one of those cases that sim and simulation came after the analytical result, usually. So what we did, we assumed that we have this waveguide. We put a material over here with the, drew the dispersion. 
which has a plasma frequency omega p. And we illuminated with this mode, and then we numerically solved this problem to look at the transmission coefficient. And transmission coefficient is this solid curve that you see over here. And you see right around the frequency close to omega p, you get a transmission near 1. And frequency omega equal to omega p means that drew the dispersion would give you epsilon 0. So it looks like it's working. And in fact, even if we add loss, still is working, but just the magnitude is coming down a little bit. In fact, 50 times loss we added, still it's working. So it's not a Fabry-Perot phenomena. It's absolutely not Fabry-Perot phenomena because you can actually change that length. And it still is working at that frequency. So just to show, give you a feel for it, I'm going to show you an animation over here for the simulation we have there. So imagine that we have this waveguide filled with air. And you send the wave over here, you see all of it reflects back. And this is a very narrow boundary over here. So everything inside is air. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to put the material there, and I start bringing the epsilon down, and then repeat the simulation. So I put it 0.5. You see, there's a little bit of wave start to leak out. 0.1, more is going through that. 0.001, all of it will go through that. It's quite interesting that how the wave actually tunnels through this, independent of this length. So in fact, if you look at the two extreme scenario that we have, one, no material here, everything reflects back. The other one, we put the material with epsilon near zero over here, everything would go through this. So the three take home message over here is this final curve that you see over here. Number one, reflection coefficient is zero. Number two, a reflection coefficient is zero even though it's a huge geometric discontinuity. Number two, the phase inside is uniform. And that's indication of n being zero. Number three, by conservation of energy, pointing vector here should be much larger than here. As a result, electric field is very strong. So you can actually have a field enhancement for free. And that's what we always want to have in the field of plasmonic nanophotonics, to have a very high field at a point. But now we have very high field, not only at the point, but during the entire structure with the uniform phase. That gave us a lot of ideas how to actually apply this to many different systems. So let me share with you some of the ideas here. But before, we wanted to experimentally verify that. So, but before I tell you how we can do experimental verification, the natural question is that, what kind of material is epsilon near zero? There are many of them. If you go to transparent conducting oxide, like indium tin oxide, this material at around 1.3 micron, the real part of epsilon is zero. If we want to go in the mid-IR, polaritonic material, polar material, like silicon carbide, at about 10.3 micron, the CO2 laser, you have a real part of epsilon near zero. Even the table salt that you have, like you know, potassium chloride, has actually at 6 terahertz, has epsilon near zero structure. Now, my good friend Nikolai Zelodev recently actually showed that the topological insulator in the UV has near zero properties there. But if you don't like any one of these frequency domain, you want to make the epsilon near zero material in the, dom in the frequency you like, then the concept of metal material will help us to put a stack of these layers together with epsilon positive, epsilon negative, to actually engineer epsilon near zero material. And finally, those of you who are interested in microwave, there's another interesting and easy way to create imitation of epsilon near zero, and that is just pick up a parallel plate microwave waveguide, just a simple parallel plate microwave waveguide, and operate it with the TE10 mode at its cutoff frequency. You do that, you get an epsilon near zero effective property. Because the dispersion of a TE10 mode follows this formula, and this formula is exactly drew the model, but not with the electron density. It's a drew the model because of the height of the waveguide. So you can easily actually manipulate the effectiveness of, uh, effective plasma frequency of that. So we actually used this technique and we experimentally verified that in my lab. So we created two microwave waveguides over here with this region, which is just air, but we operated at the cutoff frequency of that, and the result exactly followed what we were looking for. So this is a comparison of the experimental result with the theoretical result. Magnitude picked up exactly at the frequency we designed that cutoff, and the phase of the transmission coefficient crosses zero. Indication that n is equal to zero, and the wavelength inside that structure is infinitely long. And uh, so, so what happens over here, by the way, again, let me emphasize something very important. 
that this is independent of this L. So you can actually stretch this one, happens exactly at that frequency. Better yet, you can bend it 90 degrees, you can bend it 180 degrees, works at that way. We did the experiment of that. I don't want to bore you with a lot of experimental data, but we have that in the microwave. And, but I wanted to do it in optics. But before I show you the experiment in optics, let me show you some of these structures. So you can bend it like that, you can twist it like that. Essentially what it means, that the wave, wave guide acts as a wire. Just like the wire that we have over here, you bend it, nothing happens to the electron flow. Now we have a scenario that you can bend it, nothing happens to the wave. Wave actually jumps over with a phase zero across this. So one of the things came to our mind is that what would happen to actually emission of a dipole in this type of structures? Now, I showed you this picture before. Now you see if you send a wave over here, you have a very high field over here, a uniform phase. So by reciprocity, if I go ahead and I put a dipole, somewhere over here, anywhere over there, because the phase is uniform. I should get a good radiation out of it. Indeed, first we studied this, you know, theoretically. So what we designed, we designed a silver structure over here with a very tiny waveguide carved into this to operate at the cutoff frequency. We put an optical emitter in our simulators over here, and indeed you see right around the cutoff of this waveguide, you have a huge emission of the dipole coming up. And it doesn't matter where you put the dipole. Anywhere you put the dipole over there is like this. Essentially what it means is you're stretching the near field of the dipole. You're stretching the near field of the dipole as long as you want. And that has a very interesting quantum optical implications that we are studying. So when we did this one, we were very excited, but I wanted to actually do this experimentally. But how do I put an optical emitter inside a structure that is 85 nanometer height and 100 or 200 nanometer white carved into a metallic silver waveguide. That was a big challenge. And I was trying, I talked to some of my chemist uh, friends to see whether they can put some quantum dots over here, but that was a challenge. Until I was presenting this in a conference uh, and my good friend, Albert Pullman, who was a director of the AMOLF Institute for Nanophotonics in Amsterdam, approached me and said, you know, I have actually equipment in my lab that can help you to actually experimentally verify this. He told me about cathedoluminescent spectroscopy. I didn't have that equipment in my lab, but he had. So we joined forces. I went for one week to Amsterdam. So first of all, this is the structure of cathedoluminescent spectroscopy. Many of you are familiar with that. Electron beams is coming over here. Hit your samples. Right at the location of heating, you have a transition radiation. So you have a nanoscale dipole that you have over here and emits photon, which includes the visible domain as well. But the beauty of that is that you can determine with the accuracy of four nanometers, where you put that dipole over there. So I went to his lab, and we put together our heads, and we designed this nanoscale waveguide. So this is the optical version of that microwave waveguide that we did in my lab. But this is a nanoscale waveguide with a two micron with a silver evaporation over here and with the silicon dioxide uh, waveguide inside of this. We put this one in the cathedoluminescent spectroscopy. Electron beams are coming down and we could actually scan it so that every point that electron beam hits, photons will be generated, and then this CCD camera or a spectrometer can actually collect the photons and show it as a function of wavelength, what we have. So first, let me show you what we expected to see. So this is a simulation. So what you see over here, at every point in this picture is the location of that electron beam, photons coming up, and if you look at the photon with the wavelength of 910, this would be the density of the states that we have there. Nothing peculiar over here, it's just like a mode of a waveguide. If in the same experiment we look at the wavelength of 624, this would be the modal structure, okay? But we, we're looking at the cutoff mode, not this higher order mode. This higher order mode was trivial. We were looking at the cutoff mode. Before we do that, this is the experimental results. So agreement was very encouraging for us that we have there. So then, we built several different waveguides with a with different width of 250 nanometer, 240 nanometer, and 180 nanometer. And then we let the electron beam go through the middle path, and for each one of these, we actually detect what would be the wavelength distribution, and this would be the plot. Location of electron beam versus the wavelength of the emitted photons, and you see this pattern. Tinier waveguide, you see this one. Tinier waveguide, you see, aha, this is the cutoff. And now you see, in the cutoff, actually happens all 
independent of the location of the electron beam. This was a proof that this waveguide actually behaves at epsilon near zero structure. Enhanced radiation, we got out of that dipole. And by the way, I don't have the slide to show you over here, but we actually also measured the radiation pattern. And the radiation pattern is completely consistent with your waveguide in unison actually is radiating. In other words, the beam actually comes not at the two ports of the waveguide, but in the side. Becomes like an antenna array all in phase. We have that. So then Albert and I, you know, continued our collaboration and we actually built that stack as well too. So this is truly a metamaterial epsilon near zero in the visible light that we build. Now, because of this feature, we said, uh huh, that's very good. If I have a very high field, I can do a lot of things over there. One thing comes to mind when you have a high field is nonlinearity. So when we were doing this, one of my good friends, Yuri Kifshar, who is, has done a lot of work in nonlinear metamaterial, saw our work over here. He said, by the way, why don't we join forces? I do work in nonlinear metamaterial. You do work on E and Z. Why don't we actually join forces, see what kind of nonlinear property we get over here? He sent one of his posts like David Paul to my group. We already had the setup. We put actually a varactor, which is a nonlinear element in microwave right there, and we bias the varactor, and we actually do the measurement, and you see actually the system would self-tune itself. As you change the microwave power, actually that varactor changes its, its epsilon, and the system actually works in a very nonlinear, very nice way there. That was in the microwave domain. But recently, by the way, in collaboration with my good friend Luca Dal Negro in Boston University, we decided to actually do this in the near IR. And, uh, and Luca can actually make ITO, indium tinoxide, which is actually very good ENZ material as around 1.3 micron. And indeed, we showed that inside you can have a very high field, and you can have actually third harmonic generation enhancement due to the fact that you can actually enhance the field inside the structure. And I know my good friend, Professor Boyd, has a lot of interest in nonlinearity in ENZ, and I very much look forward to talking to you, Bob, today and tomorrow with your students in this regard. Uh, another thing to do is that whenever you have high field and uniform phase, another application come to mind. How about if you use it as a sensor? If you have high field, you can actually bring the height very, very small, so you can actually have a high field almost for free. For free, meaning that you don't need to have a very high energy over here. You can make a high field by actually bringing the height down. So actually, it's a very simple formula. Ratio of this height over this height would give you the field enhancement. Very simple. So what we decide to do is to actually have something which we call it E and Z transistor over here. So what you can do, you can actually change the epsilon over here, and that hugely is going to change uh, this, uh, the, the output. It's kind of like a gate and source and drain. So one of the things we are studying right now is to look at the possibility of using this in microfluidics. If I can send the fluid through here, as the fluid goes through here, it actually I can see the variation of that at the output. And these are the, some of the uh, here, results. That this is our result of our analytical study that shows that indeed this will work. Now, one of the things that caught my attention as we were working with this ENZ structure is that there is another similar, not similar, but analogous effect, by the way, in superconductivity. Now in superconductivity, effectively mu is equal to zero, effectively. But that's actually better yet to be called extreme diamagnetism that we have there. Now because of that, the magnetic field B cannot enter into the structure. That's one of the reasons that the magnet can, can actually levitate there. So we said, wait a second, actually epsilon near zero, vector D in Maxwell's equation cannot enter. So is there an interesting analogy? Can I have an equivalent of electric field levitation? rather than magnetic field levitation. So we decided to study this. And actually, if you compare, you know what happens to the magnet over a superconductor is a complete analogy to if you have an electric dipole over the region with epsilon near zero structure, with a big difference, that this can never be in the DC signal. You cannot have epsilon near zero in the DC. It has to be dynamic. So as a result, this dipole has to be a dynamic dipole. It could be an optical dipole that you excite with a laser. It could be a microwave dipole that you excite with as an antenna on top of a structure that would behave as epsilon near zero. Now, we studied this, and we got actually surprising result. In fact, if you take a look at this, you see this is the height of the dipole to the structure versus the value of the epsilon of the substrate. And you see there are two different colors over here. The red one means repulsion, levitation. The blue one means attraction. So if the epsilon of the holes is between minus one and plus one, 
you actually get levitation. You don't need to have epsilon equal to zero. Any range between minus one and plus one would do. Now, at first when we studied this, we said, okay, well, maybe the loss is gonna kill that. But actually, this is one of the phenomena that it's very robust to the loss. In fact, in this case, the imaginary part of permittivity is zero. In this case, we put 0.8, very, very lossy structure, and still, the system works. So one of the things we are planning to do is to actually show this first in the microwave, then we're gonna go into optics to see whether we can levitate nanoparticles. And if we can do that, that could be quite interesting from the removing of the friction. So if I illuminated the laser and the levitate particle, then the fluidic can actually move it without having, kind of like a magnetic levitation for the train, but that would be for the nanoparticle, but for the dynamic scenario. And uh, uh, you will hear from my good friend Modi Segev in his talk, he's one of the pioneers of photonic topological insulator. It turns out that the ENZ can have somewhat similar property if you magnetically bias it. If you magnetically bias it, you can have a scenario that the optical signal actually only have a surface state, but not the bulk state. So you can actually go around this, and then you can actually have a cavity that the light gets in, and the only way to get out is through another part. It's, it's immune to defects, and it's really protected you know, topologically. <clears throat> now, so this was what I take you back and how we introduced ENZ and brought you back to right now as some of the effect over here. But in recent year, particularly in, in past year and a half, we got very interested, and for the reason that you're gonna see, is to explore the following. What would happen if both epsilon and mu near zero? Now why, why not just stick with epsilon zero? We already have it. Because in the case of epsilon zero, one limitation was the height. I had to make the height small in order to have a wave go through. If I make a height large, we have a lot of reflection. So I, I wanted to have that restriction removed. And I want, went back to the formula we have in our PRL paper in 2006, you noticed that there was another one, mu r. So I said, what would happen if you make mu r also equal to zero? So, we decided to look at this, particularly with this concept that could we actually macroscopically decouple electricity and magnetism? And what, what would happen to the quantum optics of that? What would happen to the device aspects of that? So let me tell you, by the way, first, the thought process that we have. Imagine that you have regular waveguide again with a PEC, PEC wall made, filled with air. And imagine you have a simple mode that's going through this. Very, very simple. No reflection, transmission is one. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to come over here, cut this waveguide in half, put one half over here, one half over there, and I'm gonna ask this question. What if I wanna feel the region between these two waveguides such that the observer at the input and the observer at the output would not know that this waveguide has been cut? In other words, what should be the material inside this structure with the arbitrary shape, with the arbitrary shape, this is not a fabric peru with the arbitrary shape such that the transmission coefficient would be exactly like what you have over here. In other words, I want this entire region to behave as one point electromagnetically, even though you could have any size we want. And the answer to that is you have to have a structure that epsilon and mu both will be near zero. Now, <clears throat> So let me sh show you first an interesting simulation that motivated us. So imagine that we go over here, hypothetically, we put epsilon and mu equal to zero, solve Maxwell's equation. You get this. This is a magnetic field distribution of the mode that you see over here. You see very nice propagation. This is just a regular wavelength, regular wavelength over here. Inside, wavelength becomes infinite. As a result, everything is moving with unison. That's for the magnetic field. But for the electric field, it becomes like this. For the electric field becomes like this. And in fact, it's very interesting because in this structure, curl of E is equal to zero, which means the line integral from here to here would stay the same. That reminds us of Kirchhoff voltage law in circuits, but now you can do it in optics. So you can actually completely bring the Kirchhoff voltage law in optics, make the curl of E is equal to zero, make the Faraday's law to be zero on the other, term, other side from macroscopic point of view. Now, this encouraged us to see what would happen if we have such a structure, and you notice over here, it doesn't matter where you put the ports. You can put the port anywhere you want. Reflection is zero, transmission would be one. 
doesn't matter if it goes like this, or it goes like this, or it goes like this, or it goes like that. That entire region becomes one point electromagnetically. But, of course, the natural question is that, what kind of interesting effect it has in quantum electrodynamics? That's one of the things we are studying right now. And if time permits, I'm going to show you one, I mean, ongoing results that we have right now. We want to study superradiance of this to see what kind of superradiance we have in such a structure, because wavelength essentially is infinite. Near field is stretched. So the two emitters over here, in some sense, feel that they're in the near field of each other. How about subradiance? How about long range collective states of multi emitters? How about long range entanglement? Can I entangle two states, even though they're far away, but by having this structure in between? Because effectively should work as one point. How about cavity quantum electrodynamics of this? But before we get to all of this, and this is an ongoing work, the question is how do we make such a structure? I already showed you how we make E and Z. But how do we make such a structure in which both epsilon and mu will be near zero? Mu usually is much tougher to deal with. Particularly, you don't want to use magnetic material, because magnetic material has a lot of loss, you know, a lot of headaches. The question is, could we actually do this without using magnetic materials? Just by using structures, just by using proper design, by using dielectric. OK, let's see what we can do. I already showed you this slide, how you can have epsilon near 0. That, we have several examples. You can use actual materials if you like to. You can use engineered material if you like to. So do the following. Let's take any one of these examples as I E and Z host. And now let's do the interesting things. Let's assume I get, this is for a moment the two-dimensional scenario. Let me assume I get the structure that the host is epsilon near 0. So one of those examples I showed in the previous. Now what I would like to do. I would like to make this structure look like not only its effective epsilon is near zero, but its effective mu is zero from an outside world, because I want to look at it macroscopically. I'm not interested in the local effect, but I'm interested in the global effect. So here is one way. You can actually come over here and put a dielectric rod inside this structure. This dielectric is simple dielectric. You can use it silicon. You can use anything you want. You put it there. Then, by choosing the size of this and given the epsilon i, which is the regular dielectric over here, then it is possible to actually design this such that the effective permeability also will be equal to zero. Now, just to give you an intuitive feeling how you can do it, let's do the following. Let's assume that this dielectric rod has a circular cross section. If it has circular cross section, the formula becomes very, very simple. In fact, this formula is actually our prescription that the, if you look at this formula, you notice that you can design the radius of this dielectric rod, the epsilon of this dielectric rod, and the area of this cell such that this effective mu becomes 0. Very simple recipe. I'm going to show you that actually how we have done this. But before I show you, there is another way you can actually make the effective permittivity and effective permittivity 0. And that's by using photonic band gap structures. Professor C.T. Chen from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology showed that if you design the, uh, the structure with the photonic band gap structure such that you actually operate at the Dirac dispersion with the accidental degeneracy, you can have an effective index near zero. So that's another way of doing that. So let's go to this structure that I showed you over here. And imagine I want to use it as a cavity. So what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a closed cavity over here. The background is epsilon near 0. I put a dielectric over here with the epsilon, normal epsilon, like 9, you know, and so on. And with the diameter about, you know, land over 4 is a reasonable structure. And this is the field distribution of a resonant mode over here. But this cavity is a very strange cavity. Because whenever we have a cavity that has certain high Q, if you change the boundary of the cavity, the resonant frequency will shift. If you change anything in the cavity, resonant frequency would shift but not this one. This cavity is actually immune to the change in its shape. So you can actually move this dielectric rod here, here. Resonant frequency does not change. Field distribution changes, but resonant frequency does not change. You can even keep the area and just change the shape in any arbitrary way you want. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. All of these cavities have the same resonant frequency, but very different 
field distribution, as a result, different Q. So you can actually have a very interesting scenario that you can decouple your design of your resonant frequency away from the design of your line width. So you can have a different line width without actually moving the things there. So we actually look at the 3D scenario of this. I don't have time to go through the detail of that, but 3D scenario is even more interesting because the, the, uh, the, the volume doesn't have to stay the same. You can even change that. So here you can have a structure with this topology. You can have structure with the foreign objects added to it. You can have a structure like this, and all of these have the same resonant frequency. And you can actually put some dent into this cavity, change this dent. You can change the Q, but not its resonant frequency. This is resonant frequency is the same, but the Q can change. So we decided to actually experimentally test this in microwave. And so this is the setup that we designed. Three different cavities, intentionally three different shapes, with a dielectric rod in between that we can put in three different locations. So we have nine different cavities, if you will. Actually, we have three, but we just moved the rod three different ways. And uh, before we did the experiment, we look at you know, the simulation of that, and simulation was encouraging according to our theory. This means the resonant frequencies stay over here. Doesn't matter what shape this cavity has. So we build the cavity in the microwave. These are the structure that we build over here. And just two weeks ago, we finished the experiment. And right now, we are actually going over the data, and data actually supports that. Now, we still need to do more work in order to make sure that everything in the experiment is completely you no know, 100% double check. But right now, the preliminary result that we are getting after the post-processing of experimental results are very encouraging. Hopefully, in a month or two, we're going to submit the manuscript. So finally, what kind of interesting interaction of dipole-dipole in quantum emitters this will have? I mean, we are looking at some of these as ongoing ones. So let me just show you some preliminary results of this. So imagine I have two quantum emitters I put next to each other in a regular waveguide. And when we do that, of course, we know that the decay rate and the, and the, sh uh, and the uh, resonant shift of the atomic transition, of course, would change because of the effect of the other dipole, like a Dickey state and so on we have here. Obviously, that depends on the separation of this, and we all know that's a very standard problem. But what I want to do, I want to do this. I want to cut this waveguide again, as I mentioned before. I want to put this cavity between this, and I want to bring these two dipoles back over here and study, again, the collective interaction, depending on the coupling coefficients that determine the decay rate, spontaneous decay rate, and also the frequency resonance shift of this transition. So if you follow this standard formula and we apply it to this case, let me assume, for example, in this case, we choose one of those cavities that I showed you over here with the dielectric rod over here, background E and Z. We put the two dipole in our, uh, uh, in our study. This is the theoretical study we have. So what we're going to do, we're going to move this dielectric rod around. And as we move, we're going to calculate this collective interaction and compare it with the collective interaction before we put the cavity and find the difference and find the normalized difference this expression. And when you do that, you see, as a function of changing this location, the difference is extremely small. In other words, these two dipoles, these two quantum emitters, they feel as though they're in the near field of each other. No matter what you do with the dielectric rod there, no matter what you do with the shape of that cavity, that cavity behaves as one point. And so far, also, from quantum optical point of view, it looks like one point. Now, that remains to be seen. There's a lot of things we still don't know. We are trying to study some of the quant cavity quantum electric dynamics of that. So people would say, OK, if you do this, how are you going to do that in microwave? I want to do that actually in optics. But in order to do in optics, I cannot use regular metal because the metal would be lossy. So we decided to design a photonic band gap structures with the intention that in the future, hopefully in the near future, we would like to do experiment. So what we did, we designed this structure, just made of silicon. Just simple silicon, except this region is designed to have effective index near zero. This region is designed to actually have a band gap, so nothing will go. So we have two waveguides coming like this. So if we look at the two dipoles over here and look at the field distribution, this would be the magnitude and phase field distribution you get over here, independent of where you put the waveguide. Here is one case, here is another case, here is another case the two dipoles should feel the same way to do that. Of course, this is just a theory so far. We would love to do this experiment. That remains to be seen. So work in progress. What I'd like to do is to combine this type of crazy cavities 
with break of time reversal symmetry. In other words, what kind of entanglement I have if I bring non-reciprocity over here? And that's some of the things that we are working on that right now. Could we actually break the entanglement in the opposite way? This can entangle with that one, but that one cannot entangle with this one. We'll see. So let me stop over here, the summary of the work that we do, that indeed, as Professor Harosh mentioned, we are in the, in the area that, you know, with the proper uh, design, you can have a very unusual light matter interaction. In this particular case, we are looking at the platform, an extreme platform of light matter interaction, such that you can have scenarios that would give you extreme parameters, like extreme dimensionality, extreme information processing at the nanoscale, and, uh, and this topic that I talk about, extreme parameters, whether epsilon zero, mu zero, index near zero, and all light matter interaction. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So, Nader, thank you, Renner. Fantastic talk. You, thank you. You had, me at, uh, you had us on the edge of our seats. Thank you. We are running short, but there is time for some questions. Oh, but lots of questions. Many Iranian questions, as it turns <laughs> out. <laughs> Every, maybe you first. Yeah. So, uh, fantastic talk, uh, fantastic also. Uh, would you please comment on the, on the uh, exchange of momentum? Uh, with a zero, uh, near zero index. Mm -hmm. So because I see a discontinuity, a huge discontinuity there, and huge force. No, the, uh, yes, I mean, the momentum is there, but the momentum is fine. In other words, what happens is the following, that if you look at the, uh, I mean, energy momentum diagram of this type of structures, if you have an unbounded epsilon and mu near zero, then the group velocity would be zero. But the question is, you never have unbounded system. In all these cases that I showed over here, the system is always bound which means there's an input and there's an output. So the structural dispersion comes into play, and that actually is the reason that the energy actually goes through this. That's one reason. Another reason is this is one of those cases that actually loss is good for us. Because if you look at the energy momentum diagram, just a simple parallel plate waveguide or simple Drude model without a loss, if you bring it to omega p, obviously your epsilon is zero, but then your, uh, your phase velocity becomes infinite, your group velocity becomes zero. However, if you introduce loss, which any natural structure has loss, then the energy momentum diagram, by the time it gets close to that, actually is a ba band bending. And that band bending would give the slope, which is not zero. And that's how you have group velocity that can go through. Tommy, who's next? So if I, if I understood you correctly, you said for this uh, wave guide at the bridge, if you change the height, OK, there, in enhancement at the free enhancement that you get for this field, uh, the ratio between the height of the uh, yeah. wave height, okay, there is a limit, yes? And how, how much you can enhance? Oh, well, I mean, conceptual, in principle, in principle, you can enhance it as much as you can bring this height closer and closer. Now, you don't want to have a short circuit, because if you have a short circuit, all the wave would come back. So you should not have any current tunneling from the top to the bottom. So you can bring it close enough that the electron would not tunnel. If the electron would tunnel, then you get a reflection. So. But that means that you can have actually good amount. For example, in the optical experiment we did, the height was 85 nanometers. We got a very good enhancement there. What, Even, what was the enhancement? I don't remember it right now over here. I can show you, by the way, we have the result. I think it was about uh, maybe 10, 15 of that. Because uh, that was slightly different because we had the electron beam coming like this, rather than the energy coming from an outside waveguide. So the enhancement was, was different enhancement than what we want. In the case of microwave, enhancement, the enhancement was something like 100 times. But in the microwave enhancement, that's not surprising, because you can have a coaxial cable that the electric field inside of that is very high. But the, but the interesting point about this is that this system actually doesn't have an inner conductor. In other words, you can actually play around with the dispersion of the structure to the advantage of the system you'd like to design. I'd be happy to talk to you in the detail of that. And there's one more question in the back. There was a third hand that went up. Uh, I mean, you briefly touched on this, especially our answer, but uh, how one with one, you know, ideal, it's one to one very high field enhancement, but also you want to have no group velocity. Yes. To, to do something, something. So how do you, how do you manage with the group velocity? Uh, excellent point. Actually, that, that goes hand in hand. Because as you bring the height of that waveguide closer and closer, field will be enhanced, but the bandwidth becomes narrow. And when the bandwidth becomes narrow, your group velocity will go, uh, go down. 
So that's exactly what you want if you are after the slow light structure. That would help you with the additional advantage that the structure doesn't have to be straight. You can bend it, you can squeeze it any way you want.